Hello, glad that you're joining us this evening. We're going to wait a few minutes while everybody is let into the webinar. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you all sorts of wonderful things about art quilts. Um, we are expecting um, around 200 people this evening, so it's going to take a few minutes for everybody to get here. But we're really glad that you're joining us. Um, and we're looking forward to telling you all about the history of the art quilt movement and what's happening in art quilts today. Uh, North Kingston has been very wonderful in sponsoring this presentation and Studio Art Quilt Associates, SAQWA, is providing the technology to make it happen. Um, unfortunately, our North Kingston host um, went to join this webinar a few minutes ahead of time and discovered that his internet was out. So he's quickly driving back to work um, to be able to get to proper internet so that he can moderate our Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to having Bob Martone join us and be able to participate in that way. Um, right now, what I'd like to do is to start. I am Martha Seelman. I am the executive director of an organization called Studio Art Quilt Associates, known by our acronym of SAQA or SAQA. And the North, and so I live in Connecticut. The North Kingston, Rhode Island Arts Council was looking for some lecturers to provide a virtual program of information about art. And they contacted me to ask if I would do a lecture. So um, I'm gonna start my screen so that you can see what I'm talking about. So, this is Layered and Stitched, the Art Quilt Movement. North Kingston, Rhode Island is a lovely town in Southern Rhode Island, uh, which has a really active arts community. Here's some photos of from 2019 events that they put on during the summer. The North, so it's nkartscouncil.org. And this year, of course, they are putting on a series of virtual events. So here are some of the upcoming events uh, that North Kingston will be hosting. Um, Art Venture has applications due March 16th. And their third lecture in this virtual lecture series, Il Gigante, Michelangelo and the David will be on April 8th. And if you go to the North Kingston Arts Council website, you can register for that event as well. We are bringing together two different groups today, people who are in Rhode Island, part of the North Kingston Arts community, and members of Studio Art Quilt Associates, of which I am the executive director. So SAQWA has a great website, saqa.com. And if you enjoy what you see tonight, if you go to the website, we have close to 4,000 art quilts on the website, and we invite you to go and look around and learn about art quilts and enjoy. If you go to the section called art, one of the things that we have is an online collection where you can search by keyword, by artist, by region, by genre, and get a new virtual exhibition each time you search. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the history of the art quilt movement. When um, I and Sandra Sider, Nancy Bevore, and Lisa Ellis started writing this book, Art Quilts Unfolding, 50 Years of Innovation, 
it was uh, 2016. And at that point, we thought that if we used 50 years, we could tell most of the history of the art quilt movement. Now that it's five years later, that history is expanding. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as well. But this book, Art Quilts Unfolding, is available on Amazon or wherever you prefer to buy your books. And I encourage you to see if your local library would like to stock a copy. The quilts that I'm about to share with you cover these 50 years and are all taken from this book. So um, there are about 400 other quilts in the book and it's been really difficult for me to choose just a sampling to share with you this evening. In thinking about how to present history, I wanted to have a way to make the passage of time more concrete. And what I realized was that these 50 or 60 years, depending on which ones you're counting, are actually the years that I've been alive, more or less. And then if I looked at the passage of time through my life, it would be a way to help to conceptualize the passage of time for the art quilt movement. So here I am when I was born in 1960. The, in writing the book, Art Quilts Unfolding, we had to decide how we were going to define the art quilt movement. And we had to decide therefore when we were going to measure the, the start of the art quilt movement. And there were a lot of absolutely incredible quilts that were made before the late 1950s when Jean Ray Laurie started making art quilts. Um, and you can see them in museums and you can see them in um, online and in various collections. The distinction that we decided to use is that Jean Ray Laurie in the end of the 1950s was the first artist who started using the quilt medium, fabric and stitch to purposely create a work of art that was not intended as a bed covering. It was not intended to bring comfort or to keep somebody warm. It was intended to be art for the wall. So this is one of her early pieces. And um, what I would like to um, have you pay attention to as we go through the passage of time is that around the time I'm being born, the colors that she's choosing are this sort of off-white linen look fabric and then a lot of earth tones. And for me, the background fabric particularly is very evocative of when I was a child. My mother had curtains in the living room made of a very similar fabric. And as we go through time, I'm gonna point out where changing styles, fashions, preferences, clearly affect what artists are making during that time. Here's another piece. This one's made in 1968 by a Californian artist named Therese May. And here I want you to again notice that there's browns, that there's this sort of golden yellow color that shows up in a lot of quilts from this period. And this is a quilt that Therese made based on a photo of her daughter. The other thing that I want you to notice is that the early quilts very clearly reference the bed quilt. So the artists who were making quilts to be considered as art, nonetheless, their frame of reference, especially in these early years, was the bed quilt. And so the pieces are very large. This one is 84 inches tall by 72 inches wide. And you'll see a lot of those. And it's not that every quilt was that big. The Jean Ray Laurie piece is small. And it's not that now all pieces are small. There still are a lot of pieces that are being made that are very large. But overall, there's a trend over time to move from the size of a bed quilt 
down to the size of a painting that you would hang in your living room. The other thing I want to emphasize is that while most of the early makers were American, there were also artists in other countries who were also exploring how to create art with fabric and thread. This is a work by Leslie Gabrielsa, who lives in the Netherlands, and his work is made of fabrics that he finds in thrift stores and flea markets, and each one is carefully edged with a hand-stitched blanket stitch. However, this is still very large, it's 70 inches tall by 96 inches wide. Now we're moving into the next decade. That is me with my younger brother and my two younger sisters, and we're all wearing our lovely Norwegian sweaters that our parents had bought for us when they went on a trip to Europe. One of the things that happened in 1970, one, and I apologize that the quality of this image is so blurry. I will try to get a better image for the next time. But this is a really important event, and that is the exhibition of abstract design in American quilts that was held at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1971. And this is important because this collection of quilts was displayed on the walls like paintings rather than being displayed on a bed. And it's that movement from the horizontal plane of a bed to the vertical one of a wall that really opened a lot of artists' eyes to the potential of the quilt medium as a way to create art. And a lot of the key leaders of the art quilt movement in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan saw this exhibition because it traveled extensively. And that's what, why, or at least part of why, they started making art at, out of the quilt medium. This exhibition right, or soon, or I think now, is on display again at the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. And if you have any excuse for traveling there, you should. Um, they are not only showing this exhibition, but they are also showing several additional exhibitions where contemporary artists either respond to or reflect upon their experience of seeing this exhibition and how it has affected their art. So that's the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, and you can look it up online. Here's another artist who is um, definitely inspired by seeing that exhibition. Molly Upton from Massachusetts um, made a series of art quilts in the 1970s. Again, look at the size, 90 inches by 100 inches. Um, some of her work is now in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and some of it is in the New England Quilt Museum in Lowell, Massachusetts. And if you have the opportunity to visit either of those institutions, you can inquire about the possibility of getting a behind the scenes to see Molly Upton's work because it's very striking, very graphic. This piece is by Joan Schulz, again from Northern California. And not only is it large, 90 inches square, but look, we're again seeing that gold color that I associate with this time period um, as I was growing up. The other thing that you can see in this slide particularly well is that in the 1970s, the quilting was still primarily being done by hand, not on a sewing machine. The piecing might be done on a sewing machine or it might not be, but the quilting was mostly done by hand and was therefore fairly simple in its design. It, if you look in the gold section on the upper left, you can see a very simple grid pattern. And most of the other quilting either follows the lines of the pieced fabrics or it's a simple fill. 
as we move forward in time, you will see that not only will there be more quilting by machine, but that the quilting will become more and more elaborate until today, one of the sort of standards is to use an industrial quilting machine called either a mid arm or a long arm quilting machine. And that quilting lines as close together as a 1 16th of an inch apart are now considered fairly standard. And that's one of the big things that I've noticed in looking through the history of the art quilt. Here's another artist whose work I really admire. Nancy Erickson lives in Montana and has since the 1970s been doing an extensive series of work about animals in the environment and how we interact with both of those things. Note again, it's large, 108 inches by 84 inches. So the other important thing that you need to know about the 1970s is that in 1979, the very first quilt national competition and exhibition was held in Athens, Ohio. And it was held in this building, which was a dairy barn and was converted into an art space. And they needed exhibitions to then bring people in. And one of the people that they approached about uh, putting together an exhibition was an art quilter named Nancy Crow. And she helped with some other people to organize the first Quilt National. And Quilt National has been continuing every other year since then. And this year uh, will occur in the end of May. Here's another quilt still in 1979. And again, we've got that wonderful harvest gold color in the background. This one and it, um, is a quilt with a message. And as time goes by, you'll see a lot more message quilts um, being created. But again, look at the quilting pattern in the background. It's not quite as easy to see on this slide, but again, it's a very simple grid pattern. Here's another European, Charlotte Ede, lives in Denmark, and she came to the United States um, for some kind of either student visit or some kind of an exchange, saw American quilts, and was so taken with them that when she went back to Denmark, she started making this kind of art quilt and started teaching other European artists how to make art quilts as well. Here's Nancy Crow. I mentioned her before as one of the founders of the first quilt national exhibition. And this is the work that she was doing in the 1970s. It's very large and it's also extremely symmetrical. And we're going to look at her work again a little bit later on and see how her style of design changed over time. Michael James is the other um, person in the 1970s who was starting to make art quilts. And like Nancy Crow was very influential in teaching other artists um, his knowledge of color and design. And so when we interviewed artists for the Art Quilts Unfolding book, um, many, many, many of those artists credited either Nancy Crow or Michael James with really inspiring them to take their art to the next level. Now we're gonna go into the 1980s, I'm getting married. And here's Jean Ray Laurie again. So with her quilt was the first one we saw. And now it's 1981 and her style has really changed. The color palette has changed. The uh, geometry has changed. Um, this one is a larger one. It's 70 inches square, 71 inches square. Um, but <clears throat> um, the style is very, very different. And I associate this style with the 1980s, the idea of optical illusions in art, 
was very popular and we're going to see several pieces where that's um, what the artists are doing in their work. In 1982, this is a piece by Yvonne Porcella from California. And Yvonne is very important to Studio Art Quilt Associates because she founded it in uh, just a few years after making this piece. This piece is just itself 60 inches tall by 48 inches wide. So it is larger than life size. So while it follows the design of a, of a kimono, it actually could only be worn if you were in the NBA. The other thing that's um, happening at the same time is that some artists are starting to experiment with improvisational piecing, um, exploring different ways to combine colors, to move away from the rigidity of, of a qu art quilt that somehow mimics how a painting looks and instead celebrates the flexibility that fabric brings to a piece of art. This is Rosie Lee Tompkins, and it's part of the Eli Leon collection that is now housed at, um, oh, I'm blanking, the Bay Area uh, Museum of Art and Photography. And we will be hosting a presentation about this collection um, sometime, I believe in November. And at the end of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about signing up for Textile Talks, which is a series of free lectures. And if you sign up, um, then you'll know when this lecture is coming up and it's the curator of the collection, Elaine Yao, will be giving an in-depth look at this whole collection of Rosie Lee Tompkins work. Tim Harding is an artist from Minnesota who started experimenting in the 1980s with a very unique technique where he layers different colors of silk and then cuts through them, peels back a variety of layers of the underneath colors and then tacks them down to create these just amazing um, art quilts. And this is the piece that's on the cover of the book. Here's a piece by Michael James from 1986. And we're gonna see how his style is starting to shift um, from that earlier piece from the 1970s into this piece in the 1980s. So he's still exploring fluid lines, color interactions, but now he's doing some really interesting things with colors shifting over a, a large area and with the edges of the quilt no longer being rigidly rectangular, but instead extending off into space. Here's one of those optical illusion pieces that I was telling you about. This is by Linda McDonald, who lives in way Northern California. And this is the work that she was doing in the late 1980s when those optical illusion types of art were very popular. And here's one more. This is Irene McWilliam, who is from Ireland. And every time I look at this piece, I am absolutely positive that that chain is actually three-dimensional popping off of the surface of the quilt. But of course it isn't. And um, I just love this idea of the globe being in the center of these locked floating rectangles. This is a Massachusetts artist, Ruth McDowell. And um, the, one of the things that is unusual about Ruth is that she creates these wonderfully uh, organic forms, but she does it completely by piecing the fabric together rather than applicating those curved sections one on top of the other. And um, I just love the, the color of this, especially this time of year when we're all longing for spring to arrive already and our flowers to start blooming. Carol Breyer Fowler Gentry 
made this piece in 1989. And it's a very important piece because this is the first piece that was machine quilted that won a major award. And the fact that it was machine quilted and winning the big award was a huge controversy in the quilt community at the time. Because up until then, as we talked about earlier, the, the standard was that, that quilts should be hand quilted by hand stitching. And this one was machine stitched. In 1989, this is the letter that Yvonne sent out to 50 people she knew who were making art quilts to invite them to join her in starting Studio Art Quilt Associates. And then we get into the 90s. And this is when I started quilting. Um, this is my older daughter, Katie, sitting next to one of the first quilts I made and our cat, Charlie, um, on top of a wedding gift that I made for my sister. So you can see that I was not interested in art quilts when I first started, that came later. But here's Carol Breyer Fowler Gentry again. So her quilt was that uh, Cosmo Spiral that was the first machine quilted quilt to win a major award. And this is the quilt <clears throat> that, that was really instrumental in getting me interested in what could be done with art quilts. I, so this is one of a series of, I think, 150 art quilts, all using this twisted tuck technique where those stripes of vertical color are actually a folded fabric that is inserted so that it sticks out a little bit from the surface of the quilt and then Carol has twisted it back and forth and tacked it down so that depending on where you stand relative to this quilt you see different colors. If you stand to the right of it you're going to see that whole spectrum of colors that you can see going through the middle. If you stand to the left of it, well, all you're going to see are those black and white stripes. And as you move back and forth, your view of it changes. And when I saw the quilt that was here in Connecticut on display, I spent a good 15 or 20 minutes walking back and forth and watching it change. And I was absolutely mesmerized. So here you can see her two styles. You can see that they're very different in style, but that her love of showing a full spectrum of color remains unchanged. Also at this time is Katie Pasquini Massapust, who also is a very influential voice within the art quilt movement, um, a teacher of thousands probably at this point. And this is uh, one of her pieces that she made um, during this period in her career, where she took a photo, translated into a black and white version, and then sent these shafts of color running through it. This piece I put in the um, lecture because I wanted to share how Studio Art Quilt Associates SACWA has a very broad definition of what an art quilt consists of. So our definition is that if it's layered and stitched or that it references the traditional quilt in how it looks, it counts as an art quilt. So this piece by Kyung Ai Cho is made of squares of wood. The wood has holes drilled into the edges of each little square, and they are then stitched to the background. So it's layered and it's stitched. And also it's the design of it references visually a traditional quilt design. So we consider this an art quilt. This, <clears throat> excuse me, this is another 1990s piece by Jane Sassaman. And I really have always loved this piece because it's just such a dramatic, 
graphic design uh, celebrating spring, celebrating nature. And um, Jane said that her daughter is named Willow. And so she made this piece in honor of her daughter. Here's another piece that has to do, that is an example of things that would surprise most people um, when they see them and hear that we consider it an art quilt. This piece, Money for Nothing by John Leffelholtz, um, is made up of little tiny packets of sugar. And there's a detail down here at the bottom where you can better see all of those sugar packets, like the ones that you would get in a diner. The sugar packets are layered between two layers of some kind of screening or to tool that holds it together. And then they're stitched to hold them in place. And then all those little plastic flies are, are attached to the surface, which John has painted to resemble a $100 bill. This piece is by Ricky Timms. We're still seeing really large pieces in the 1990s. And this piece is 86 inches square. And here's the later work by that artist, Nancy Erickson, who likes to showcase animals and their relationship to the environment. This is her 1990s piece. And here's the piece that we saw from the 1970s. So they're still large, they're still showcasing animals, but during the 1990s and the 2000s, Nancy was doing a lot of exploration of the idea that um, cave, you know, we have cave paintings where people uh, drew animals on the walls of the caves and she's exploring, well, what would animals draw? And what if the animals were drawn upon? And what does that say about our relationship with the animals with whom we share the planet? Now we're up to the 2000s. I have five kids. Katie, the baby that you saw earlier is now in the middle. So you can see how time has been passing. And here's Nancy Crow again. Um, Nancy has now really changed the style in which she's working. So here's that earlier piece. It's very controlled. It's very symmetrical. It's very geometric. And this is the piece that she made in 2001. And this is part of her constructions series. You can see this is number 45 out of what is a very, very large series of work where she's cutting the fabric improvisationally. She's not planning it. She's not using a ruler. And then she's putting it together improvisationally and finding how, ways for those colors to really work together, but in a very different method than her earlier work. So here you can see them again side by side. The other thing that happened in 2000 is that this piece Precious Water won a major award at another major quilt show. This won the International Quilt Festival in Houston. And this was controversial because this quilt is not pieced. It is not applique. It is one big piece of fabric that has been painted and then quilted. And as you can see, from the newspaper clipping, should Quilter reap what she didn't sow? This was huge. People said it's beautiful, but it isn't a quilt because it's painted. That's now changed. Painted quilts are all over the quilt shows um, and the competitions and the art galleries. Um, but at the time, it was um, a real shock for a lot of people who had not thought about what really defines making a quilt. Uh, I wanted to share with you this piece um, being made by a Russian artist. Um, this piece traveled in one of Sakwa's ex exhibitions that I curated. So I got to see it in person. 
And I just love all of the details and stories that are happening. I think maybe my favorite story is the one happening in the upper left, where you see three young people who are not sure they really want to watch whatever the event is happening in the opera house. And the middle young man has a rat on his head. And I asked Isabella, why is there a rat there? Is it dirty? Is there a problem? And she said, no, in Russia at the time, pet rats were really popular. And you weren't cool unless you took your pet rat everywhere with you. This is a piece by a New York artist named Michael Cummings. Um, is, he's uh, works also very large size. Um, what he has said is that he has a second bedroom in his townhouse and that he can work as big as the floor. And that's as big as he can get. And this is part of a series of pieces that he has done about the Black uh, experience in America. This one, obviously, the Middle Passage. Uh, and one of the things that I find interesting about this, besides its perspective, is the um, symbols that he's put in that top border. Because one of the things that Michael does is he combines history with um, some of the African icons from African folk tales and mythology, along with things that he finds evocative of his family and growing up with a mother and a grandmother who both quilted. And so it's this really interesting mix of American history, African mythology, and his personal history. This piece by Kareem Franzen from Alaska um, is part of a large series where she was capturing the mating dance of the cranes um, in one of the wildlife sanctuaries near where she lived. And it's unusual in that while it is layered and stitched, the layers hang free from one another. So they are attached across the top but then they hang free. And so as you walk past this piece when it's hanging, the wind of your movement makes it flutter, which is very evocative of the birds and the leaves. Shiaki Dosho is a Japanese artist. And this is one of her many pieces made from recycled kimono. And trying to capture movement in a physical object that's designed to hang still. And in this case, it's the movement of color and all of those dangling threads, which similarly to the piece we just looked at, move as the viewer moves near the piece. Jennifer Bowker is an Australian artist whose husband was an ambassador to Egypt. And while they were living in Cairo, she made friends with a lot of the people she met there and then captured um, portraits of many of the men that she met when, she, when they were moved back to Australia. And this is one of um, those portraits. This is of the man who is the keeper at the mosque, who the doorkeeper at the mosque. Now we're up to the most recent decade, the 2010s. And in the 2010s, my children started getting married. So this is the marriage of my middle son. And Katie, the baby that you saw earlier, is now on second from the left. In the 2010s, um, I think this is the only piece that's large. You're going to start seeing the sizes get smaller. And when, you, when there's a photo that really shows it, take a look at how the quilting is getting more and more complex. This was part of a Sakwa exhibition. Um, and 
I love the idea of the animals floating in, trying to find room on the earth um, and the man sort of hovering over it and protecting it and saying no room. This piece is by a California artist named Lisa Chikajic. And I include it because I just think it's a incredibly powerful, dramatic piece. And what I find astonishing about it is that it's completely created by appliquing layers of fabric on top of one another. There is no paint in this image whatsoever. It is all made out of fabric. And again, my brain insists that it must be actually three-dimensional when it's completely flat. This is a Japanese artist who is working in a reverse applique technique where like Tim Harding, when looking at those two swimmers in the silk, Fumiko is layering different colors with a black on top, then cutting through um, a variety of layers, depending on which color she wants, and then tucking the black fabric around those cut areas to create these absolutely stunning works of art. But look at the size. We're, we're maybe half the size, maybe even a third of the size of those original pieces. The other thing that you're going to start to see is um, a lot of three-dimensional sculptural work. So I talked about how that exhibition at the Whitney Museum of Art in 1971 moved the quilt from a horizontal on the bed to a vertical on the wall. What we're now seeing more and more of is artists starting to move the quilt off of the wall entirely and creating sculptural works. So um, this is Kate Crossley's Box of Delights. And it, it is um, 59 inches tall. So um, almost, almost five feet. This piece is by two artists who collaborate, Chris Sazaki and Deb Kashat. And it is part of their series of work commenting on popular culture, popular uh, fascinations. Um, I love it because this is so clearly uh, a McDonald's Happy Meal and all of the headlines that they've collected and put together into this image are about eating, and obesity and diary of a foodie and um, happy hour and coffee break. And it just comes together to be a piece that really makes you start to think about our culture and food. This is another European Esther Borna Mitzvah is from Hungary. And here's another example of the quilt coming off of the wall, in this case to be an installation of works. At the very end of the room, uh, in front of that window, there is a piece hanging on the wall, um, but the, all of the other parts of this installation are freestanding. This is an artist from South Africa. And while it's hard to see in this photo, this piece has a three-dimensional aspect of it in that that sort of Y-shaped insert is actually behind the rest of the layers um, so that it, it um, sticks out from the wall um, maybe a good two inches. This piece is by a Texas artist, Carolyn Crump, and it was part of an exhibition looking at the Black experience in America. Um, and this also is slightly three-dimensional in that the flags um, stick out and the man who is jumping off the ship to drown comes out from the piece, about four inches. 
This piece is completely three-dimensional. This is one of uh, 10 pieces in a circus by Susan Else from Northern California. And each of her pieces, while your initial take is that it's happy and childlike and delightful, when you take a closer look, she is making a small commentary about different aspects of uh, the American culture. In this case, it's um, that the horses that are being ridden are actually the people and the riders are the animals. And she's asking you to think about how we regard animals and what if everyone's places were reversed. Here's another sculptural piece, this one by New Mexican artist, Betty Busby. Betty started her career as a ceramics artist and recently has been revisiting that vessel form, but this time in art quilts. And so her vessels are made of layers of fabric and they're stitched. This is another Japanese artist, Noriko Endo. And um, she works a lot with this technique where she cuts up fabric into thousands of tiny pieces and then arranges them somewhat like a mosaic and then traps them under a layer of tulle and stitches them down. And I just think this is absolutely beautiful. Cherry blossoms and moon. One more three-dimensional piece. Home is where the army sends us by Kristen Laflamme. And um, we just showed this in the exhibition that's traveling, that's based on the Art Quilts Unfolding book. And I love the idea that what's important is this sense of family and home and that that's portable. This piece is by another Northern Californian artist named Judith Content, who creates her fabrics um, by taking lengths of silk that are a solid color, wrapping them around a plastic uh, PVC pipe, discharging the color off of the parts that sort of stick out from that wrapping. And then when she unwraps them, what's left are these wonderful striations of color. And in this particular piece, you can see that she also incorporated some leaves into that wrapping discharge process and that the leaf shapes remain on the silk. And all of her work is inspired by water in various forms. So this is indigo ice. And this is a Canadian, Mary Powell, and I hope she's here today. Um, I love ending with this piece because um, I'm fascinated by her ability to capture people's portraits based on layers of cheesecloth. So the darker areas are where there's just a single layer of cheesecloth and the lighter areas are where the cheesecloth layers have been built up. And if you study it carefully, it's sort of amazing how little information your brain needs in order to, to see Leonard as you see him. This is the last art quilt. This is A is for art. Um, and this was part of our benefit auction. We hold a benefit auction every year in September. And if you go to sakwa.com, you can find information for this year's auction as well. Just to bring us up to date, my granddaughter, Charlotte, turned one um, in 2020. And it's just part of how this, my life has cycled through um, during the development of the art quilt movement. Here again is the book that this lecture was based upon. And um, it, uh, sorry, and it's available 
through Amazon. Here is Sakwa.com, which is our website where you can see 4,000 additional art quilts. And if you enjoyed this, please do sign up for textile talks at sakwa.com slash textile talks. We are one of six organizations who presents a free lecture to the public every Wednesday at two o'clock. So all you have to go is to do is go to sakwa.com textile talks, register for the next textile talk, and that will then put you on our mailing list so you'll know what's happening every Wednesday at two. The textile talks, we've been doing them since the end of April, and they are all recorded and available through YouTube, and the link is also there. So sakwa.com slash textile talks, and you will be able to learn about a wide variety of different textile art topics. Okay, as I told you, Bob had an internet problem um, when we were starting, but he's now driven to a place with good internet. And um, Bob, if you turn your mic and your video camera on, there he is. Um, Bob, Bob is going to be asking your questions and we'll take as many questions as we have time for. And I wanted to thank you for a wonderful presentation that was, it was absolutely, that the, the artwork is absolutely stunning. You've done a beautiful job pulling it together. Um, it's um, absolutely enthralling and I'm going to go grab your book. If I can, <laughs> if I can look at all of those again. Great. So, there are a number of questions that all seem to be focused on something similar to the question that I had, which is, is it boils down to what qualifies as a quilt. So you have a question, how does Kate, Kate's Box of Delight qualify as a quilt? Um, how does, um, and I'm, I'm missing, I'm looking for the other one, but but, but again, the three-dimensional sure. quilts, how do they, I mean, you don't put a, you know, a big structure on top of your bed or anything. So how, what, no. what is a quilt? So the way that Sakwa defines an art quilt mm -hmm. is that it is layered and stitched or that it references the traditional quilt at the you know bed cover quilt. But the important part is that it is layered and stitched. So Kate Crossley's Box of Delights has mm -hmm. layers and it's stitched. And so we consider it an art quilt and we have exhibited her work in some of our traveling exhibitions. Okay, um, and we have another question. How is art quilting different than textile art? Or is it the same? I, I, I would say it is a subset of textile art. So when I think of textile art, I think of weaving, I think of knotting, I think of embroidery, I think of tapestry, I think of a lot of kinds of surface design like silk painting or printing, whereas quilt art is very definitely definitely has that layered and stitched quality to it. So it's a subset of textile art or fiber art. Okay. Um, there was one, there was a, another question about um, the material that was included. Um, so and it was it was phrased as gotta ask is there sugar in the sugar packets <laughs> <laughs> i assume so i cannot imagine that he carefully opened them all up and put them all back together <laughs> um so i assume that there is sugar in the sugar packets um he is known for <laughs> using unusual materials to create quilt art quilts um, mm -hmm. and they've been shown several times in Quilt National. So he has used matchsticks, he has used the aluminum uh, gutter covers stitched mm -hmm. together with weed whacker cord. He, um, and he's most recently been doing a number of things that we still consider an art quilt that are actually um, large panels with LED displays, but because he's putting them into that grid, it mm -hmm. still qualifies as an art quilt um, because there's layers. I don't know that there's really stitching, but we, you know, it references that traditional quilt format. Okay. Um, so we have another one. 
um, if the art does not need, quote unquote, extremely close quilting and the artist chooses to quilt more sparsely, will this count against it in the juried process, assuming all else is equal? In other words, do you have to um, sure. follow the times uh, yep. or follow your muse, which is, which is important. <laughs> which is most important you you definitely need to follow your muse. It's your art. Do it how you want to. Um, mm -hmm. We hire outside jurors for every exhibition that we do. And what that juror is going to choose, we leave up to them. So we consider it an art quilt, no matter how much quilting there is. But okay. what the juror will choose is up to that juror. And some jurors are much more focused on technique. And some jurors are much more focused on design. We try to find ones who are interested in design because we are looking for things that are art Mm -hmm. um, rather than things where all your seams match the way a traditional quilt competition might be judged. Got it. Um, so what do you see as regional differences in the history of the art quilt? How have they changed over the years? Um, this question comes up quite a bit. I have had mm -hmm. lengthy discussions with um, people in Europe about how European art quilts are different from American art quilts or different from Japanese art quilts. Um, mm -hmm. Like a lot of these kinds of discussions, I think there are more similarities than there are differences. But if you wanted to make sweeping generalizations that everybody could poke holes into, there is a tendency somewhat driven by what materials are available to the artists um, mm -hmm. for Europeans to use more muted colors and more abstract designs, Americans mm -hmm. to use a much more uh, full spectrum um, number of colors and to be particularly interested in realism, whether it's portraits or still lifes or nature, and mm -hmm. the Japanese to, again, like muted colors, but um, more in those sort of taupe and indigo ranges that are traditional colors used in Japanese clothing. So there are specific regional differences in, in color selections. And, 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 and but th there is probably more similarity than not. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Festival of Quilts in Birmingham, England. Mm -hmm. And there was an exhibition there where each of the quilt guilds from different countries in Europe um, sent in examples of their members work and when I walked up to it I assumed it was an American exhibition and I think that has to do with buying commercial fabric which is American fabric is now available worldwide versus making your own fabric by dyeing it painting it stamping it stenciling it where that maybe is where you are more likely to see some differences in color palette Interesting. So, um, uh, so next question is, where do you see the uh, art quilt going in the future? Um, I'm seeing a lot more sculptural work. Hmm. I'm seeing a lot more work that even if it isn't sculptural is mounted or framed, um, which I think is partially commercially driven, that if you're trying to sell your art quilt, and you put it in a gallery, you want to make sure that the viewer knows that it's art, not a potholder. And so putting it in a frame sends that message, boom, this is art. Um, but I am seeing a lot of uh, freestanding sculptural work, a lot of experimentation with new materials. Um, so traditionally, uh, quilts were made of cotton, silk, or wool. And now we're starting to see a lot more non-wovens, a lot of um, interest in upcycling plastics and single use things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And people making art with it rather than adding it to the landfill. Interesting. Yeah, so the, the idea of, of it being framed is sort of ironically, so the, the, the notion of when, when you had those quilts where they were going off out of the mm -hmm. rectangle, that was basically saying, this is not a quilt, right? This is okay. something that this is a piece of art. This isn't, a, a, you know, something for conventional use. Mm -hmm. um, so we're up, we've got a minute left and we have three or four questions. So CFS, we can do this. 
Um, of the original artists from the 50s and 60s, how many on, on percentage are still making quilts these days? Well, sadly, a lot of them have passed away. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were not that many people making quilts in those early decades. And unfortunately, even where they are still making and they, um, what they have as a record of the work that they made are slides, color slides. And what we have found when we went to put the book together is that that color film has, the color has really shifted. Usually it's become very yellow. Mm -hmm. And so the color is no longer any good. And so where we could, mm -hmm actually get a hold of the physical quilt, we had it re-photographed. Um, but part of the problem is records. And um, you know, one of the messages that we try to give our members is the importance of keeping records of what you make and then making sure that those records are updated as the technology changes so that you can still um, see those earlier pieces that you made. Um, so we have three more questions. Sure, let's do okay. it. So does a quilt made from a kit quality, uh, from a kit, so does a quilt made from a kit qualify as an art quilt? Um, if you're making it as a piece of art, it is an art quilt. If you want to enter it into a Sakwa exhibition, for the exhibitions, we mm -hmm. ask that it be your original art. So it's not based on somebody else's pattern. It's not based on somebody else's kit. It's not based on somebody else's photograph or painting or what have you, but that it's your own original design. But that's only for exhibitions. If you just want to um, hang out with other people who are passionate about art quilts, um, you're welcome to become a member um, and you're welcome to create art however you want to create it. Fantastic. Um, have you got a glimpse about what the future art quilt will look like or the elements contained in the, in the future? So you already um, spoke about three dimensionality. So yes, yeah. Happens? And um, I think that we're going to also consider, continue to mm -hmm. see um, technology really shifting what people are making. So I spoke briefly about the industrial long arm quilting machines really shifting the kind of quilting that's expected in competition level quilting. Um, but the other place where we're seeing technology is the use of photos being put through your computer, um, changed in Photoshop, printed onto fabric through one of many different services that you can now hire or doing it yourself, and then embellished, added to, stitched. But technology is definitely changing what is being created. And it's really interesting to see that work. Hmm, interesting. And then finally, how many of Sakwa's members come from an art background and had to learn how to sew versus coming from a traditional or semi-traditional quilting background and learning art? All right, well, <laughs> Sakwa has almost 4,000 members in about 39 countries. Mm -hmm. And I don't know <laughs> an exact percentage. If I had to guess, I would guess that more than half probably came to art because they like to create things with their hands. And as they were making quilts, they started to improvise, started to innovate, started to do things that were their own designs, and then came and found us. But less than half, and I don't know an actual number, um, mm -hmm. came from a fine arts background where they got a BFA or an MFA at school and then started looking for the medium that really spoke to them. And so while they might have been painting or printing in school, when they discovered art quilts, they said, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, fantastic. Well, we're at, we're at the um, bottom of the hour. Yeah. Thank you so much for a fabulous presentation. Really enjoyed it. It was really tremendous. And um, I feel very fortunate to, to um, have your contribution to, to um, some of the efforts that we're trying to do around uh, artistic talks. And, and uh, so, so thank you very much. And really well, appreciate it. it was my pleasure. Thank you so much to the North Kingston Arts Council for sponsoring this lecture. 
and um, it is being recorded and mm -hmm. will be available both through SACWA and through the North Kingston Arts Council for anybody who wants to watch it or share it or what have you. And thank you so much, Bob. I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. We did too. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.